Scott, over to you. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Sarah. And hi, everyone. Thanks for taking some time out of your busy schedule to, um, to join us today. And hopefully um, you'll learn a thing or two. And if you do, as Sarah said, if you have any questions, just um, pop them in the chat and Sarah will, will ask them during the, the presentation. So if you see a slide that you want more information about, then feel free to, um, to, to pop a question in straight away. Um, so before we get into it, I'll provide a bit of background. As Sarah mentioned, I was a sports physio uh, for 15 years. And during that time, I focused on injury prevention. So I spent some time at the Institute of Sport in the biomechanics and performance analysis department where we used wearable technology to measure the physical demands of training and competition load for the athletes. And then we measured their capacity to withstand those demands. Now, if those demands were matched to the athlete's capacity to withstand the demands, then generally they wouldn't break down. They wouldn't get any overload injuries. So these are non-contact sports. With contact sports, unfortunately, you're always at risk of, of um, contact-related injuries. But with your non-contact sports, which is your, your rowing, triathlon, swimming, running, they're the ones where the training load and the competition load matches the athlete's capacity to withstand it, and they're not getting overloaded, then they won't, the risk of injury is, is much lower. So I did that for 15 years. And then my mother sustained an injury working as a nurse and she was lifting a patient in a way that she shouldn't have been. And it ended her career, resulted in seven levels of her spine being fused. So I saw firsthand the impact of avoidable injuries in the workplace on the quality of life of the people who sustain those injuries and their families. So I started transitioning a lot of the, the knowledge and technology and skills from the sports injury prevention sphere across to the workplace. Um, and it, it was a long journey. We got government funding to build what we have now and we tested it with various universities. But the purpose being, first of all, to build some tools to help the worker understand when they are at a risk of injury and help them modify their, their movements to reduce risk, but also to build a tool to help safety professionals use data to drive their decisions when it comes to reducing injury risks and returning injured workers back to, to full workload. So we'll go into the, so the, the, the presentation now. A lot of this may, you may have heard before, a lot of it may be common sense, but it's worth reiterating anyway. We've got the current problems with workplace injury prevention and return to work programs. I first used this slide nearly six years ago and most of these problems still exist. We still have clients who are approaching us with these same problems um, six years down the track. So education training methods are ineffective at changing behavior. We know that. PowerPoint presentation showing people the safe way to lift, um, it's ineffective. Workers just see that as a bit of time off or they even, even worse, they'll see it by as a, a, the information presented by someone who has no idea how to do their job. So they'll sit back and think, well, how are you telling me to how to do my job? I've been doing it for 20, 30 years. You're a physio who's one or two years out of uni and you're telling me how to do my job. So we know that education training methods are ineffective, the current classroom-based education training methods. Most safety professionals are limited by time and resources. So to actually spend time to identify the individual risks for every single task and every single worker isn't practical. Approaches are not specific to the individual injury risks. So going back to the sports example, if you go to any professional team, any say, well, to say AFL, any professional AFL team back 15 years ago, there would have been a general injury prevention program for everyone. And it would have targeted the high risks for that particular sport. Now, if you go to any professional team, every individual athlete has their own injury prevention program based off their specific needs. So whether they've got weakness or strength or whether they've got tightness in areas or their history of injury. You know, the biggest predictor of a shoulder injury is history of previous shoulder injuries. So these days, every individual athlete has their own individual program. That can be adopted to the workplace if you measure the data that highlights those risks for the individual. And if you use technology to deliver the specific training to that individual, targeting their needs. And that, that technology we'll get into in the next few slides. And assessments are still observation and opinion based. So you still have a lot of people doing risk assessments on an iPad using observation and opinion rather than actually measuring and using the data to say, well, when we do it this way, the demands are X, Y, and Z. If we do it this way, the demands are higher or lower. 
yes, you add that to the observation. You don't want to replace that because observation and opinion is core to identifying risks. But having data to back up those observations and opinions is really valuable. So the most effective injury prevention and return to work programs or return to sport programs occur in sport. So there's no, um, there's no real surprises there, but it's supported by decades of research because in certain sports, if an injured athlete is not playing, then that sports organization is losing a lot of money. So that's why there's been so much research focusing on getting athletes, well, first of all, preventing injuries with athletes, but second of all, if they are injured, getting them back as soon as possible and with a condition that's making them more resilient. So hopefully they won't get, they won't re-injure or sustain a subsequent injury, which is an injury to another body part as a result of their training changes that happened from the first injury. So the key is measuring movement quality and measuring movement quantity. So in workplace health and safety, as I transitioned across from sports um, injury prevention to the workplace, I noticed the WHS world focused primarily on range, not reaching too hard, not rotating too far, not bending too far, awkward postures, but they neglected the quality of movement, the movement control. So if everyone on this call right now stood up and very slowly bent forward and touched your toes, it's a hazardous range, but it's actually a good stretch for your back and your, and your hamstrings and your hips and your pelvis if it's done smooth and controlled. If you do that same range of movement with a lot of acceleration and deceleration, so if you do that movement with jerky, uncontrolled movements, the range is exactly the same. The movement control is totally different. So that's a big part of the difference I saw early on between workplace health and safety and the sports space was the biggest predictor of injury risk in sports is an athlete who has a lot of accelerations and decelerations and the size of those accelerations and decelerations whereas that information hadn't really translated across to the workplace. Establishing specific baselines about load. Now, this is the first time I've mentioned load and it's gonna go through it in a lot more in these slides, but in sports, it's about measuring and managing the training competition load. And so making sure that you've established a solid baseline and then any athlete that deviates from that baseline, that's when you need to make adjustments. So primarily, if the athlete's response to the training is going above the baseline, or if their training volumes are going above the baseline, then you needs to, their training needs to be modified. They need to be brought back down to that baseline. Same principles can work in the workplace. You've got baselines for specific occupations or even locations. You can have similar tasks across the whole country, but different locations may have different baselines based off the demands of the, the tasks in those particular locations. So a key component is establishing baselines that are specific to the demands of what the workers or the athletes are undertaking. So here's just a definition of load. So this is the AIS definition, which is load is a process of quantifying the amount of physical training that an athlete undertakes using variables relevant for their sport. So the load algorithms for a swimmer would be completely different to a rugby player. So that's the AIS definition. Now that could easily be translated to the workplace. So load is the process of quantifying the amount of physical tasks that a worker undertakes using variables relevant for their occupation. And that's what we've done over the last, that's what we've built over the last five, six years. So we'll go through the preventative measures. There's primary prevention, which is obvious task assessments, pre-employment screening, but then there's secondary prevention. Now, this is the big differentiator between sport and the workplace because there's pretty much no secondary prevention in the workplace. It's early detection of onset, which we'll get to in a minute. And then there's tertiary prevention, which is the prevention of re-injury. So that's the return to work process, which is a bit more, well, it's, it's quite good in most cases for workers' comp, but it could obviously be better. And we'll talk about why now. So the secondary prevention involves these three phases. And these are the three phases of the onset of an overload injury. So the first phase, you've got the biological onset. So that's where the demands are slightly above the capacity for the individual to withstand those demands. And the only way to detect that is through data analysis and monitoring. Like I said before, having that baseline and knowing there's an athlete or there's a worker above that baseline, if they're doing more than the baseline, then theoretically, there's gonna be the biological onset of injury. 
The next stage is the detectable signs. And that's where there's tightness. That's where there's niggles. We all feel it. You know, when you feel something is not right or you feel a little bit of a twinge somewhere, that's the detectable signs. And workers often work through that, unfortunately. They'll feel a bit of tightness and a niggle and they'll just get on with it. So those two stages, the biological onset and detectable signs, they are easy to detect using wearable technology and measuring the load on the workers. Because the next stage, that's usually where an injured worker pops up on the radar because they've got pain and dysfunction and it becomes a claim. So as you can see here, this could easily and is now easily being used in the tertiary prevention space. We're using this data now and this process in the return to work phase. We're measuring the load that the work is doing. We're building it up and we're making sure that it doesn't deviate too much from the path. They're not getting overloaded because of a particular manager who's saying, we've only got you for three hours this shift. We really need to get this work done, that sort of thing. So that's why now this data analysis component is being used in the return to work space. So I've mentioned load a couple of times. How do we monitor load, especially for secondary and tertiary prevention? So measuring range of motion is not enough, as I've mentioned before. So the types of load, you've got external load, and that's primarily what I've been talking about the biomechanical load. So that's the range and that's the control of the movements. But then you've got the internal load, which is the physiological load, that's heart rate. That's how you measure whether a worker is physiologically recovering from what they're doing. There's chronic load, which is over a long duration. So for an athlete, that would be a training cycle. But for a worker, that could just be a shift. A full shift is the chronic load. And that's made up of the acute load. So the acute load for an athlete is a session. Acute load for a worker would be the tasks that they undertake. So the specific physical demands of each of the tasks they do through a shift that add to that chronic load, which is a full shift. Now, this is a really interesting concept we're exploring at the moment, which is the acute chronic load ratio, which has, there's a lot of research showing that this is a high predictor of injury risk for athletes in particular sports. We're still, we've got enough data. We're still really trying to work out what that ratio looks like in the workplace. But when you measure the demands of tasks and you've got a, a load variable for that, if you measure the demands of a full shift, you can actually use this concept of acute chronic ratio to identify whether a particular individual has a high injury risk or not. So that, I think we're still probably a year or two away from really getting some research behind that. But that's a really good concept. And like I said, it's really, it's, proven in um, for athletes for particular sports that that acute chronic ratio has a real power for identifying and predicting injury risk. So how do we calculate load? Here are all of the variables that have been used in load algorithms across multiple different sports. So you can see some of them are subjective, but most of the ones at the top in particular, but most of them are very objective. However, most of these aren't relevant in the workplace or they're not really practical in the workplace. So as I said before, internal load can be measured using RPA wellness questionnaires. So internal load is a physiological load. Now RPA is rate of perceived exertion. So that's basically where a worker writes down how hard they feel that task was or their shift was. And wellness questionnaires as well. That's asking the worker, well, how is your overall well-being? Are you tired? And, and unfortunately, these are usually very inaccurate because a worker, especially blue collar workers, they're going to fill them in based off what they think their manager wants to hear. So if they are tired, they don't want to lose their job. They'll say they're not tired. If they're feeling good, they might say, well, actually, I'm feeling tired because I don't want them to think I'm not working hard enough if I'm not tired. So RP wellness questionnaires, the validity of them in the workplace is nowhere near as what it is with athletes because obviously athletes are going to be honest because they want their coaching staff to know whereas in the workplace not so much heart rate that's a really good um, value to a really good variable to measure for internal load but in the workplace most workers that we spent time with five years ago when we started building what we built they didn't want heart rate measured for the exact reason as i said they don't want the managers to know how hard they're working or how hard they're not working the heart rate and galvanic skin resistance is a new variable that basically measures sweat, sweat gland activity, which is an indicator of stress response or the sympathetic nervous system activity. 
that's not really practical in the workplace, but it is something that's really good at measuring in, uh, physical, you know, the physiological load and temperature. Again, most workers, unless they're in an environment where temperature is critical, if it is a really hot environment, then yes, they would need their temperature measured so they don't get, um, get heat exposure and, and, um, and those sort of negative consequences of the environment. But most workers don't want their temperature measured. VO2 blood lactate is the best, but it is obviously not practical taking blood samples from workers or measuring their VO2 using face masks and that sort of thing. So VO2 blood lactate is the definitely more specific for the sports, measuring the internal load for athletes. But now if we look at the external load, now this is where it's very practical to measure time and duration of tasks. Most people already do that. And shifts, obviously, they measure the duration of a shift accelerometry now that's just basically a device that measures the acceleration of movement and then gps which is a measure obviously of where they're moving and how far they've moved now our enforced dynamometry and power this was an interesting one we started measuring the force demands of tasks early on in this journey but we found you can measure the force required for a particular task so say it's moving a box from point a to point b so the force required to do that is the same for every worker. It'll be the force required to lift it and carry it and place it down. However, you could get 10 different workers and they would use a different combination of movements to apply that force. And that's where the, that, that's where the value is. You don't necessarily have to measure the force. Obviously, these days, most tasks, they've reduced the force down as much as possible based off the Safe Work Code of Practice and the international standards for manual handling. But what they can't do is actually modify the workers' movements. They can provide training, but this is where the accelerometry and the time duration variables are really valuable at measuring how the worker moves to actually exert the force in the first place. So that's where we've, what we've built over the last five years has shown a lot of value in measuring the way the different workers move to perform the same task. And you'll find that even the most basic task where you think, well, there can't be too many different ways workers can move to do this, you'd be surprised. I mean, you've always got taller workers, shorter workers, different gender, different age. The reality is, all of these all of these variables add up to different movement patterns for a worker to complete a task. And when you measure that, that's the first step at creating an individualized program for that individual to make sure that they're not getting overloaded. Here's an example of what an athlete's training load would look like. And a lot of the times when I'm doing these presentations, people just think, well, is it just about reducing the load? But we know that physical load is actually good for our health and well-being. Physical work, if it's managed well, is good for physical resilience and health and well-being. And so it's not necessarily just about reducing the load as much as possible, because then you can get deconditioning, which is a problem that occurred during COVID with lockdown. A lot of workers, when they were off their job for four, five, six weeks, they became deconditioned to the physical movements required for their job. So then when they went back, they pretty much had to brush off the cobwebs and get their body moving again. So that's where decreasing the load can actually be worse for the workers. And I've actually, there's an example of, um, that I had a couple of years ago, which was a dairy factory, where they introduced an automatic robotic pallet packer. So previously, there'd be two people going between the stock and the, the pallets and getting all of the stock and putting it on the pallet and wrapping it up. And it was replaced by a robotic machine that would do it all for them and they just stood there and they push buttons so the physical condition of the workers decreased but then unfortunately this robotic machine would break down quite regularly so all of a sudden these workers their physical condition had dropped because they weren't loading these pallets they weren't doing that exercise and their physical condition had dropped but then when the machine broke down they had to go out and do it again but they had to do it at a faster rate because the robotic arm was doing it faster so obviously a lot of them broke down in that respect. So that's where it's not necessarily just about reducing the load or eliminating the load. It's about managing the load. And this example here, you can see, especially the red line, there's the load goes up and down. You can see this is a typical of an athlete where you've got to build up the load and then have recovery periods. But for this athlete, the injury and illness would always occur either at the peak or at the trough of that red line. So most of their injuries occurred when there was either that period of overload, which is needed for a training program, or that period of underload, where there would, there would be a little bit of deconditioning. 
So it's not just about reducing the load, it's about managing the load. So addressing the needs of the worker, this was at the core component of what we built in the first place. We had to understand what the needs of the worker was. So you need something that's valid and reliable. They wanna know whatever data they're seeing is actually showing what's really happening. There's no point of using a sensor where the data is actually not really what the measurement um, or what the body movement is. Data analysis to identify and reduce risk and build confidence in the movement. That's a pretty key component, but the research shows that you need to provide feedback to the worker at the time and at the location, otherwise it's a waste. So if you give them a report at the end of the shift saying at 10 a.m. or at 12 p.m. you did a movement that was high risk on a high load on your back, it's a complete waste. But if you provide feedback to drive behavior change in the environment at the time, then the research has shown that that's effective. And also in combination with education and exercise, the physical conditioning programs. And so there's research supporting that as well. What are the needs of the employer? Okay, so using data analysis to identify injury risks for specific tasks, gradual progressive increase in the workload for return to work in the same way that an athlete would gradually build up their training load and reducing risk of re-injury by using the load management. So making sure that after they're back to full load, you still measure them for a week or two to make sure that they're not actually drifting back into bad habits. Looking at sustained postures, obviously, and then creating a safe work environment. That's common sense, using, using the sensors to detect um, if there's any slips, trips and falls. And of course, all the, the normal ergonomic principles which apply. And that's something actually I'll go back to that because a lot of um, ergonomists see this technology as a threat. And the reality is this technology should enhance any ergonomist skill sets because they're using a lot more data to drive their, their opinions and their decisions. And so the traditional ergonomic approach is still very valuable. And they're actually, unfortunately, I've, I've spent a bit of time in the US where there are other technology companies that are basically promoting themselves as digital ergonomists. So saying you don't need an ergonomist anymore, just use our technology. And we believe that's a bad way of, of approaching the market primarily because it's the opinions of the ergonomists using the data, that's gonna get the, the overall outcome. So that's where the, the value and the experience of ergonomists is key. And so it's never, you never need to, or you never want to neglect that. So wearable tech enables a remote service delivery. So sensors on a worker, this is the, the platform that we've built, sensors on a worker that connect to a smartphone where there's initial processing and the feedback to the worker, which is then sent to the cloud-based dashboard and then the safety team can monitor it from anywhere in the world now. But is it really applicable to the workplace health and safety industry? Yes, it is for sports, we know that. But recent, it's funny, it says recent, re recent research, but um, it's actually 2018, so I probably should remove recent there. But they did a good survey of 80% of, of OHS professionals and 80% would consider using wearable tech. The most valuable data they found from using it was identifying awkward postures, forceful exertions, which again goes back to not necessarily measuring the force, but the exertion of the worker when applying that force repetitive movements and fatigue. So that, as I said, that was 2018, so it's not so recent anymore, but it's still a very valuable, it's a very good research um, paper that was, that was delivered back then. So current solutions to deliver it remotely. As I said before, you can have acute load by measuring the task assessments, simply popping the sensors on a worker saying, can we measure the physical demands of the task that you're doing? using video and pairing that video with the sensor data to actually get a better idea of at what point during the task the physical load is high and whether that can be changed. If it can be modified, then re-measuring and saying, well, yes, it was here. Now we've re-measured it and it's here. So we've reduced the load for that particular part of the task. So, so the building job task dictionaries, which is what people are doing now, uh, but using data driven job task dictionaries, not opinion-based, um, setting benchmarks, but also assessing new workers and injured workers when they return. Simply put the sensors on them, step back, take video and data, and then see what it looks like compared to those benchmarks. And then you've got chronic load, which is where the workers wear the sensors for a full shift. You can see hour by hour what the load on their body is, and you compare that to the benchmarks as well. 
This is actually really valuable for new workers in their first week or two on a new site um, because you, you identify whether there are any risks straight away, but also the feedback helps the new workers modify their movements in their first week. So they don't develop bad habits. If anything, the, the feedback from the sensors will, will help them develop good habits. So here's what it looks like. Here's a simple task assessment. And we've, we've chosen this one because it's something that a lot of injured truck drivers in particular are um, where GPs, when they're doing their return to work plans, are saying, well, we don't know how physical this is un undoing these curtains and, and um, loading and unloading the trailers. And so when you measure it, you can actually say, well, yes, this particular worker is all right or no, they're not. So what we're looking at before I click play on the video, the orange line in the chart is the load on the arm. The blue line in the chart is the load on the back. So you can see that's pretty flat the whole time. And then you've got that red high load threshold. Now that was developed using the international standards for manual handling. So when the wine goes, when the, the orange or the blue line goes above that red dotted line, it's considered hazardous by international standards. So you can see here the chart at the very beginning has quite a high spike, but then the rest of it is relatively low. Some of it is touching or going above that high load line. So if we click play, and you can see there that initial movement, I'll, um, I don't know whether I can, oh yeah, I can pause it. And um, that initial movement was something that no one had even considered. He has to, to unclip the, the edge of the curtain. He had to actually whack it with his hand. And so while the GPs and all of the safety professionals were focusing mostly on the job that he's doing now, which is this clipping, unclipping these ratchets and undoing the, um, the curtains, they had totally neglected or didn't even realize that the very first part of the task was actually the part with the highest um, load on the shoulder. And if you've got a, a aging truck driver with a fraying or a repaired rotator cuff, it's that first movement that really is gonna um, flare up an injury. So now we'll go through two quick case studies. What we're looking at here, this is a, this is a worker who performed a repetitive task in that they had to build these displays in a retail environment. And what we did is we measured the different, the exactly the same displays, but building them in three different locations throughout the shift. And early, the early um, assessment showed, this is what we're looking at now is the, the trunk rotation, the trunk flexion. So you can see here, they're, this is indicative of them using their legs a lot. So basically they've kept their back quite straight and they're using their legs, as you can see in the image, nice straight back and bent legs. By the end of the day, when they built their third display, you can see here, that the flexion is actually at flexion and extension is going a lot more than it did in the beginning of the day. So this is a pretty clear sign that this worker is fatiguing and they're using their legs less towards the end of the day, moving their back more, and that's a high injury risk there. This is a really good example of repetitive production line type repetition. So you can see hour by hour what the load on this worker is. Now this organization had no idea that this there were these two periods where there was a lot of load and then periods where there was not much load at all. And so what they looked at doing is changing their task rotations so that the tasks that were done in this first hour and two hours, and then this particular hour can be spread throughout the shift. So a lot of the load can actually be distributed evenly to reduce the risk of fatigue in that first hour. You see here, you've got the first hour where the back and the arm high load movements were really high. That could then result in fatigue throughout the rest of the shift. If those tasks were distributed maybe around 12, one-ish, one where there's not a lot of load, then that would reduce that risk of overload fatigue in that first hour. The key is actually displaying the data in a user-friendly way. So when I started this journey, I was displaying a lot of this data in the same way I'd present it to a coach or a sports medicine team. And um, it was too confusing, it was overwhelming. And so then we realized with a lot of feedback from um, the people using the data that we all we needed was basically a simple scatter chart and ratings chart. So you could see where the outliers were and where the priorities are as far as the tasks or the occupations. And that way um, a safety professional can put their limited time into the areas where it's needed the most. So now looking at the components of feedback that were built off the back of um, the way this product has evolved as far as 
we started with initial feedback as in the alerts, going back to what happened to my mother, a simple alert prompting a worker to change their movements at the time that they are, they are um, experiencing high load on their back or their arm. So we initially had this feedback loop where the worker would do the task, there'd be a positive or negative outcome, and then they'd get that feedback through the load monitoring loop. But then we realized that there was all this really good content that was being, that was that these organizations had around injury prevention, but it was sitting in PowerPoint slides or it was sitting in videos in the head office. So then we actually started building those training modules based on the data. So if a worker had a lot of high backload data, they would be provided automatically through the smartphone with specific content targeting that, showing them how they can, well, first of all, making them aware of it, aware of what positions and postures can increase the load on their back, but then secondly, making sure that they knew how to change it. And then we reassessed that. So we built, we built training modules. We put a QA and a component in that training module. So you could work out, first of all, you work out if the worker was doing it. So then you can do that compliance check to see, yes, the worker is conducting the training. But second of all, if we added two questions in there, as I said, one, uh, seeing if the worker could identify where the high load occurred. But second of all, seeing whether they knew how to reduce it. So that way the organizations could see exactly, first of all, they could see the movements, they could do the load monitoring, but then they could also see which workers were doing the modules and whether they understood where the risks were. And this feedback loop has proven to be really successful. So a lot of these organizations, there's no surprises that the outliers with the load monitoring, the workers who are one of the ones up in the top corner of the scatter chart, are also the ones who are not doing the modules or they're the ones who are getting the answers wrong in the modules. So it's a really good, as soon as you understand that, then you can actually address it and spend more time with those workers and then they get those scores down. So that was a really good feedback loop that we've determined that we've built over the years. So with regards to data-driven return to work, as I've said a couple of times, it's about benchmarks. So if you've got the benchmarks for each of the tasks that the worker has to return to, which is conducting task assessments on an uninjured worker. And then if you get an uninjured worker to wear the sensors for a full shift, you've got a benchmark for the full shift, the physical demands of a full shift, but you've also got the benchmark for each of the individual tasks. So that's the acute load, but then also the chronic load. And then you assess the worker against those benchmarks. So first of all, each time you, know, you, you rank the tasks uh, in order of the physical demands, and then you assess them, you approve them for the first few light tasks, you assess them, and then you see if they're ready to go back to those tasks based off comparison to the benchmarks. And then you gradually build up the load week by week, which we're trying to do at the moment, but it's very unmeasured. So when you measure it, you can actually get an alert when they're above what they should be doing or when they're below what they should be doing. Unfortunately, if you could picture a curve, a return to work curve for most workers, Unfortunately, what we want is a nice straight line where the load gradually builds up in a controlled way. Unfortunately, it's more like a curve where you've got a lot of period with deconditioning because the tasks are too light and they're not doing them enough. And then at the very end, when all of the physical tasks are approved and they build up to their full shift and full workload, that's when there's a, a gradual or a more progressive increase in that curve. So here's what it looks like when you've got, here are all the tasks for a particular worker who's returning and you can rank them according to the load. So this will be what you'd see for an arm injury, a shoulder injury. And so they would come back. And so a physician or a GP would see this and say, okay, well, obviously the physical demands for these tasks at the top are lower. So let's introduce them in stage one or week one. The next few are a bit more physical. So you can introduce them in stage two. But then stacking boxes on shelves and loading boxes from delivery, they're the most physically demanding on the shoulder. So we're not going to introduce them to week four or stage four, the very end of the, um, of the program. But then the work has been assessed against them as well. So you can see here loading boxes with a new trolley. The benchmark score is 0.6, but this worker was assessed as 4.5. So even though the benchmark score is low, the way this worker is doing it is still a high risk. So they're not ready. They need training to go back to, um, to, to get that score back down. Whereas loading timber up high, the benchmark score is 1.2. They've scored 1.1. So they're actually better than the benchmark, which is great. So this way, 
you can use data and to help the GP because a lot of the time when the GP is trying to approve tasks for a worker to return to, they're going off the descriptions from the worker or a job dictionary that's, you know, that's like a phone book. It's five, six, seven pages long for each task. And they're not going to read through that. But if they see this, they see a score, they see the work has been assessed against that score. It gives them more confidence to say, yeah, I reckon we can we can get you back to that. And you can even show them the video that I showed you before of the worker doing it and saying, look, here's what they're doing. Here's where the load is. Can they go back to this task? So keeping it simple by measuring the physical demands of each task and then introducing the task based off the scores. So here's what it looks like week by week. You, so for the medical restrictions for this worker is six hours. If their typical shift is eight hours, six hours is about three quarters or 75% of a typical shift. So then when you look at the load target should be 75% of a typical shift. What they recorded when they did the six hours was 73%. So that's actually pretty good indication that they're on track. Um, and that's another good way of making sure that the load is built up gradually and you see if they are being overloaded. So if they've got, if their medical restrictions are six hours, the target 75%, but they've just recorded 95%, then, you know, that's, they're almost doing a full shift's worth of physical work in six hours. That's a big risk. So that's where the system will provide an alert saying this, this work has been overloaded on this day. So it needs to be assessed. So keeping it simple by, measuring the light duty load on a worker throughout a full shift, and then gradually building up the load to build up that physical resilience. Because we know physical work is the best way to actually build up that, um, the, that resilience to further injury. This is a really good example of a worker who was off on light duties for over a year. It wasn't light duty, so it was restricted duty. So there were still three or four core duties for this particular worker that the GP would not give them um, approval to do because of their back injury. So what we did, we put the sensors on the worker and the worker wore the sensors for 38 consecutive shifts. And you can see here, what we're looking at is the number of high low back movements during that period. So it went from, and this is like, as I said, this was an injury claim that had gone over a year. So the worker had hurt his back. Um, and you can see here at one stage, he's doing 400 high load movements on his back in a shift. But you see every time the, the feedback, wearing the sensors and getting the alerts when he moved into a high way, you can see that over that 38 shifts, he got to the point where he learned how to move differently and reduce the load on his back. But this, for me, that was great because you can see the data and it was really impressive that this worker said to me that the sensors and the feedback gave him confidence to go back to the tasks that hurt him in the first place. Prior to that, he didn't have that confidence, but now he knows, and when he was wearing the sensors, he knew if he did the task in a way that didn't allow, that didn't provide an alert, he knew that he was doing it in a way that wasn't gonna flare up his back. So this is an exa one example of many that we've got at the moment where wearing the sensors for the workers as they're returning from an injury gives them the confidence to do a task without that fear, avoidance, behavior, of worrying about their, their injury reoccurring. And that's it. Um, so 40, yeah, we go. We've got through it in 40 minutes. So we've got 25 minutes for any questions. That's the face. I put that there because that's the face that a lot of people pull when I'm doing this in person. So I thought, oh, well, I'll put it there for um for the questions page. So hopefully we'll um we'll get a few questions. And thanks for that, Scott. I've just put a link to your website in the chat there if anyone wants to visit your website to find out more. Um, and while we wait for any questions, I'll just put a link to the webinar next week, which is another interactive webinar that we did a couple of weeks ago about um, mentoring. And um, yeah, um, there's no questions at the moment. So just wait a few more minutes, Scott, because everyone knows whenever I say that there are questions after. No, hopefully I haven't put everyone to sleep. <laughs> With, uh, um, a lot of it's been a bit boring science nerdy stuff. So um, yeah, I do apologize if we forgot to be boring there. No, it's not boring. It's very interesting. It's, it's actually quite a broad approach. Um, um, yeah, so we don't have too many. Um,
we do I do get a lot of emails when people can't make it wanting the recording afterwards and um, as you know we're supporting this HSCQ Academy so Scott's done webinars before so his previous webinar will be on there too um, and there's a question right from Brett what sort of investment is required to get started with this system uh, it depends on where you want to start so we again when we started this we had Oz industry support and one of the primary factors was to make it cost effective for everyone. So there can be simple subscriptions that are less than a mobile phone bill per month, but we generally encourage organizations to start with a pilot and a five week pilot is around $2,000. But off the back of that, you get to see whether it's going to work in the first place. We provide a report at the end saying, here's what the findings were. Here are the opportunities to make changes or to use data to reduce injury risk. So pretty much all of the, the companies currently using this um, product and all of the, the we've had 17,000 reports generated um, in our dashboard over the last two years. So there's quite a few companies using it. And I, I, I can't think of any that didn't start with a pilot. So we start with that five week pilot with one set of sensors. And then off the back of that, we then look at a subscription model that suits the organization's needs. Um, and Pam asks, how, I think this might be a similar question, how much is the investment to assess different workstations? Yeah, so yeah, same answer. Um, but uh, you know, we, it can go down, like I said, to the less than a cost of a mobile phone plan per month. And do the employees embrace the system? Yeah, well, when we, when we started building this, I spent a lot of time and I was, I've actually got photos of me literally walking around behind workers with my laptop because back then we didn't have the technology to collect the data remotely. So I'd have all these sensors on a worker and I'd be walking around behind them for a full shift. But during that time, I actually got to talk to them. So I actually got that feedback and understood what their needs were across 10 different industries. And the same data, the, the same answers kept coming up, which was they wanted an alert when they move in a way that's high load. They also wanted security to know that the measurements that are coming from the sensors aren't just going to their boss to see if they're working hard enough. So then we built in, a, we made sure that the, the data from the sensors went to a worker's account. So the, every worker has their own account. They get the feedback first. They can de-identify it if they want. So the, the data will still go into the dashboard but it won't have their name attached to it. So we gave them that confidence to actually, and when you say that, when you say, oh, look, the whole purpose of this is to protect you. But if you're still concerned, you can de-identify it. You're still getting the benefits. You're still getting the training that your, your management aren't actually going to see your name against the reports because you're concerned. But like I said, there's over 17,000 reports in our dashboard. And I'm off the top of my head, I can think of three workers um, that have actually de-identified their data across, oh, I can't remember how many companies we've got. So thousands and thousands of workers that are using it. And I can think of three that have de-identified their data. Um, so Tim says, thanks, Scott. Really interesting presentation. Would be interested to understand how the sensors measure the load of a movement. Example, in the truck driver video example, is it based on accelerometry? Yes. So it's the range as well as the movement control. Like I said before, if we just measure range, it doesn't paint the full picture. If you just measure control, it also doesn't paint the full picture. So our algorithms, which were validated through um, work we did with the University of Canberra, um, the load algorithm includes time, duration, obviously, um, range and movement control in all three axes. So yeah, obviously the, the three planes of movement. Okay, um, from Anonymous, you mentioned that it's best to give workers advice on the spot as opposed to a report at the end, end of the day. Who does that? The sensors, the sensors provide an alert when they move in a way that's high load on their body. So a worker can be remote um, in the middle of the outback doing some drilling or mining. If they move in a way that's high load on their body, the, the phone will give them an alert, prompting them to stop and think about what they're doing and then change their behavior. So it's that remote monitoring that we built. Kevin asks, could this be integrated into pre-employment medicals to highlight high-risk individuals who may need more help with lifting or postural tolerance, et cetera? Yes, definitely. So the data, so like, as I said, you can set benchmarks for tasks, but then the movement patterns required in those tasks can be replicated and the sensors can be used in a clinical environment for pre-employment. 
So rather than doing, you know, lifting a crate of weights from point A to point B, the tasks that can be used in pre-employment uh, using the data can reflect a lot better the physical demands of the tasks they're going to do. But then you've got what's called a post-offer time frame. So a lot of our clients actually put the sensors on new workers in their first week. So that way they can actually see, well, whether the pre-employment actually does reflect their risk as they're um, on the on the actual workflow, but also it gives the worker feedback so that they can change their movement patterns straight away. Because unfortunately, a lot of the environments that we're, a lot of the clients we have, they don't really have a choice. They've got to take whoever they can get um, because the tasks they're talking about, physically demanding tasks aren't exactly ones where there's a lot of people putting their hands up to do them. And so in those environments, they take, they do still do pre-employment screening, but if they find a worker that's high risk, they've still got to take them on and then they provide that feedback in their first week or two so that they can actually de-risk them as much as possible. Okay, um, to <coughs> quick follow-up question around the load, is there any way to incorporate the actual weight of an object involved in a lift or a similar task? Yeah, so a lot of our clients actually, um, a lot of the consultants add that in the notes section. But like I said before, you could, everyone on this call can lift the same weight object from point A to point B, and they're going to move slightly different to do it. So a lot of our clients add the weight in there just in the notes section of the reports, but um, the sensors themselves and the technology doesn't measure the weight or doesn't measure the force required to, to lift the object. No. Okay, um, that's all for the questions right now. Um, so I'll just wait a couple of seconds. Is there anything else you want to add, Scott? No, no. Thanks everyone for um, yeah for taking some time out of your your busy schedules to um, yeah to listen to the presentation. Um, yeah, and I'm sure Scott's contact details will be on the email later today, and also on that um, link above there if you want to ask any further questions. So. Um, and hopefully you can join us again sometime in the next year or so as well, Scott. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, thanks, Sarah. And thanks, Myosh, for um, asking us to be involved. Okay, thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.